Well, good morning, Temple Church. Welcome. We're so glad you're here with us today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you uh, if you're a guest this morning for the first time or first time back in a while. Thank you for joining us as well. Um, we love to begin our services with a focus on God's Word, uh, a call to worship, and we're going to be looking at 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 23 through 27. And here's what the Word of God says. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols, but the Lord has made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before Him. Strength and joy are in His place. Amen. Let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus, so much for this day that you've given us to worship in your name. We thank you for the great God that we can come before and worship, and we want to come before him and stand in awe of him and give him thanks for his many blessings. We want to worship you in holiness uh, and be acceptable in, in your sight. So, Lord, have your way in us this day. Um, I pray this service will be a blessing to whoever watches it, but also that our response in this service will be a blessing to you as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to get to worship with you this morning. Um, I wanted to open us up in Scripture. And in Hebrews 13, 7 and 8, it says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And so as we're singing this song, there's a line in there that says, um, you have never failed me yet. And, and we kind of get hung up on this word of yet, and we have this idea of, are you saying that he's going to fail us one day? And no, and what we're saying and what we're going to be seeing this morning is that, God, you haven't failed me yet. Why would you ever fail me in the future? Because the same God that we worship today is the same God that has carried us through everything leading up to this point in our lives that we're in. So we can trust that the God that we worshiped and served then is the same God that we're worshiping and serving today, and he's the same God that we're worshiping and serving tomorrow and the next day and, in, and until we're spending eternity worshiping him. And so I invite you into worship this morning uh, with boldness. Um, proclaim the name of Jesus because he is worthy of our praise, and, and he, is, he is the same God in, in yesterday today and tomorrow and we can and we can trust in that and we can worship him walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall but you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You've never failed me yet I know the night won't last Your word will come to pass My heart will sing your praise again Jesus, you're still enough Keep me within your love My heart will 
sing your praise again your promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness i'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail me yet i've seen you move you move the mountains and i believe i'll see you do it again you made a way where there was no way and i believe i'll see you do it again i've seen you move you move the mountains and i believe i'll see you do it again you made a way where there was no way and i believe i'll see you do it again your promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness i'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never failed me yet Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Ooh. Lay your burdens down, ooh, here in the Father's house. Check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Arrival's not the end game, the journey's where you are. You never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over, if the story isn't good. Failure's never final when the Father's in the room. Failure's never final when the Father's in the room. Lay your burdens down, ooh, here in the Father's house. Check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. come home the helpless find hope love is on the move when the father's in the room prison doors fling wide the dead come to life love is on the move when the father's in the room miracles take place the cynical find faith love is breaking through when the father's in the room the jericho walls are quaking the strongholds now are shaking love is breaking through when the father's in the room love is breaking through when the father's in the room Ooh, lay your burden down Ooh, here in the father's house check your shame at the 
door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house Good morning there, Temple friends and family. Thank you for joining us today, and I've got a few announcements for you. Uh, the first is our camps are coming up here uh, the end of June for Temple Kids, that last week, and then uh, mid-July for our Mock Student Ministries. We can't wait. Temple Kids are headed to Lynchburg, Virginia for Centra Kid, and Mock Students are headed out to Tennessee for Student Life in the Smokies. There's information. You can sign up now at templechurch.net or in the Church Center app. Also, uh, this month is when we do our Annie Armstrong Mission Offering, and all this goes through the North American Missionaries, through the North American Mission Board. And in the past, we've put a goal of about $5,000 on this. Currently this month, we've taken in over $2,000. We don't have a goal right now just with uh, the current uh, climate and all that's going on with uh, COVID uh, still among us this year. Uh, but we want you to give as God has put it on your heart. And uh, if you have any questions, you want to drop that off, you can drop that off at the uh, church throughout the week at the drop box. Also want to make everyone aware that next week, starting next week, we'll be regathering in small groups. We've kind of done this in stages. Uh, if you remember initially, we have one large small group meeting in the sanctuary. Then we invited back our mock students, our temple kids. And this is kind of phase three. We're going to be gathering uh, throughout the campus again in the uh, education building as well as in the uh, administration building for all of our small groups. And uh, we're doing a study on fundamentals of Christianity. We'd love for you guys to come out and join us. We're doing that again as a church in our small groups. And... Uh, Again, if you have a question, don't know which small group to, that maybe you would fit in best, contact the church office. We'd love to get you plugged in with a small group that, uh, that you would get along and, and fit in with well. I'm going to turn over to Pastor West today now as he prays over today's offering. So today, as you think about giving, I um, just want to remind you, as I do every week, I know this kind of seems old and redundant, but these things are so important. Um, you know, because th these are the ways that we, we, uh, we fund all the ministries that we support outside our church. It's the ways that we support our staff. It's the ways that we uh, keep the lights on and, and make all the, the uh, repairs that we're making right now in the church. And we're making great progress with these. Uh, Matt's going to be sharing some of these with you. If you come to church um, uh, in person, we'll be sharing them as well. But um, you're giving us just such an important role here in our church. But also, don't never forget that more than you're just giving to a church, you're giving to God. It's an act of worship. So um, just remember that every time that you, you give a gift, it's an expression of your gratitude, of your faith, of your trust in your Heavenly Father. Uh, you can give through uh, text to give at 84321. You can do, set up recurring giving online at templechurch.net. Uh, you can come by our church and drop off your giving or mail it in, whatever works best for you. Thank you so much, though, for your faithful support. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for the gifts that you, you bring to our church through the faithfulness and the generosity of your people. And, Father, I pray uh, you'll bless the, this offering in particular today. Uh, bless your people, Lord, who are watching, uh, and quicken the day that they can come back and be with us in, in, uh, in fellowship on Sunday mornings at our church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today I'll be reading from Revelation chapter 8, verses 6 through 13. I want to talk to you today about the sound of war, the sound of war. So Revelation chapter 8, verses 6 through 13. And the scripture says, Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and these were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it, made, it had been made bitter. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Then I looked, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice, as it flew directly overhead. Woe, 
Woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blasts of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your word and uh, what a privilege it is for us to study it, to read it. Heavenly Father, I pray today that uh, you'll help us to understand it and um, that we'll learn how to love you, how to prepare for your coming, how to live lives soberly and carefully, how to share the gospel in a greater way, that you will stir us into action in all these areas as a result of what we're learning today. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his, his coming. We thank you even for the judgments that we're reading about today, though difficult that they may be, because we know that all these things are a reflection of your will and, and part of your plan, and it's to your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today, uh, what I want to do as I begin this sermon is do sort of a review of Revelation because we've been at it now for several weeks. Um, we took a break there for Easter and we're kind of back into the routine. And if you're like me, um, you, you kind of things kind of leak out pretty quickly. You forget things that you've learned. And so every once in a while, it's good to have just a brief refresher. So let's kind of look at where we have been so far in the book of Revelation. So, um, so the first thing we learn in chapter 1 is we, we have a, a, the image of Christ. Behold Jesus, the, the Alpha and the Omega. We're, we are introduced to the one who died and is alive forevermore. Uh, his earthly ministry was rejected by many people in his day. They dismissed him as something less than the Son of God. Um, and by the way, that's what many people still do today. Many of our friends, many of our acquaintances do not take Jesus or the gospel seriously. But this book shows us that at the end of all things, that the world will see that Jesus is the most glorious and important being in all the universe. And then after we get past chapter 1 and we get into chapters 2 and 3, we see Jesus addresses his church. He offers them commendation and criticism, and he, and he uh, gives the challenge for each of them to be overcomers. And this, 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 uh, these seven churches were seven churches um, that were in John's particular time period. Um, but these seven churches are pictures of churches throughout the history of Christianity. In other words, you can look around today and it's not hard to find a dead church. In other words, a church like Sardis, or it's not hard to find a suffering church. You can look across the Middle East and see many churches, many believers who are suffering for the cause of Christ, uh, just like believers were in Smyrna and Philadelphia. Uh, it's very easy today to find a worldly church, a church that, that tolerates the wrong kinds of things. They tolerate false doctrine and sin, just like the church in Thyatira. So these seven churches, they are a reflection of all the churches throughout the history of Christianity. But then we get to chapters 4 and 5, and what do we see? We see a beautiful picture of heaven. We see the throne of God. Um, we see the angels. We see the redeemed people of God worshiping the Father and the Lamb. It's just a glorious picture. Then we move forward to chapter 6, and we see uh, things begin to heat up because the Lamb breaks the seals. And so we see the seals are broken. Judgment and destruction comes to the earth. But then we have a bit of a pause in chapter 7, and we see um, it's as though the, the, the movie has been paused and we're given another angle, and we see that God's people are sealed and glorified. And so we see the sealing of God's people with the Holy Spirit um, in really two ways. So we see them uh, as 144,000 and then as a multitude that no one can number. Um, and, and so both of these images of the redeemed people of God are showing us that those whom God saves on earth are those He glorifies in heaven. So the people of God are not kept from tribulation, but we are kept from perdition. And then we get to the first part of chapter 8, um, and we see that our prayers reach God's throne. Um, and that heaven does something in chapter 8 in those first five verses that really is, I mean, it's profound. Um, it's something that you would never imagine that would happen in heaven. Heaven becomes utterly silent in anticipation of God's coming judgment. And so the angels, they're, they're standing by, they're ready to blow the trumpets, and yet there's this pause, there's a pause, a quiet pause in heaven um, where we are shown really two things in relation to prayer. First, we're told that God hears our prayers. Not one of them fails to reach His throne. Isn't that an encouragement to you this morning? God hears your prayers, everyone that you've ever prayed. And then secondly, we learned that our prayers help shape the course of history. Uh, that's not because we have some kind of magical voodoo power within ourselves or something, but because 
God graciously allows us to participate in the outworking of His plan for history and eternity. So as we read verse upon verse and chapter upon chapter of Revelation, God is in essence showing us how He really sees things. Now, we need this perspective of Revelation because, frankly, this is not how we see things. This is not how the world looks to us. It doesn't feel this way. It doesn't feel like God has a grand plan sometimes. But God gives us these pictures in Revelation because He wants us to see the world and He wants us to see eternity from His perspective. And the book of Revelation helps us do that. Now, that brings us up to these trumpets in chapter 8. So what, as we, we look at the trumpets, let me make some preliminary observations about them uh, that I think will help us better understand them. So here's some key details about the trumpets. First of all, the Exodus plagues and the trumpets of Jericho are the background to the trumpet judgments here as we are going to see. Uh, so Revelation chapter 8 draws particularly from the first, the seventh, and the ninth plagues in Moses' day. Uh, the battle of Jericho seems to be the inspiration behind the trumpets. But then number two, the blowing of the trumpets indicates coming judgment. So in the Bible, uh, trumpets were, were blown for different reasons, sometimes for special occasions of worship in the Old Testament. We see that in the, in the, uh, <clears throat> the, the reign of King David. Um, in the New Testament, they, they um, announced the second coming of Christ. But most often in Scripture, they are associated with battle, like in the case of Gideon, Gideon or with war, as in the case of of Jericho. And perhaps if there's one example that comes in mind to you uh, about trumpets in the Bible being used in battle, above all others, it's, it is perhaps the battle of Jericho where God's people walked around the city for seven days and on the seventh day they blew trumpets and the walls fell and their, their enemies were destroyed. Now, how about another, let me give you another detail about uh, these trumpets. Number three, there's a clear parallel between the seals and the trumpets. So um, I've mentioned this before. A lot of this is confusing. Confusing. I get that. It will become probably much, much clearer as we get to the end of the book, but I'm going to reiterate some things here, and let me. this is one of, example of those. Uh, when I say there's a clear parallel between the seals and the trumpets, what I mean is they follow the same progression. And uh, if you read this, you'll, you'll pick up on this. So you have the first four seals, and then you have the first four trumpets that are open. And then you have followed by two more seals, and then you have followed by two more trumpets. Uh, trumpets. And then there's an interlude with the seals and an interlude, if you would, with, with the, the trumpets. And then finally, you have the final judgment, which depicts Christ in His second coming. Number four, the trumpets cannot be limited to one particular period of history. This is a key, key detail, very important point. One of the key questions that we need to ask when we study the seals, the trumpets, and, and also the bowls is, do they refer to specific events or uh, specific events or, or single happenings, dates, or persons in history? Um, is, is that what we're going to say? So we, we look in history and go, okay, that's exactly when that happened. That's the fulfillment of the trumpet, the third trumpet. That's the fulfillment of the fourth bowl. Because if, if we take that view, then frankly, it gets pretty complicated because we have thousands of dates and events and persons that fit these symbols that we're learning about in Revelation. So what we end up with is thousands of interpretations, but not really any certainty, with just a lot of speculation. A better approach, in fact, I believe the correct approach, is to see the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls in Revelation not referring to specific events or details of history, but to principles that are operating throughout the history of the world, especially throughout the church age. In other words, they refer to things that happen again and again and again in history. They do not symbolize single or separate events, but they refer to woes or, in other words, horrible things that may, that may be seen uh, any day of the year in any part of the globe. So uh, a simple way to say this is they're not datable events, but they simply describe the commonplaces of history. Let me give you a quote by uh, William Hendrickson. He makes, um, he makes a compelling reason for why it's important for us to view the book of Revelation this way. He writes, For if these symbols merely indicate and predict isolated future events, it may satisfy some people's curiosity, 
but it can hardly be said that people in general are edified. On the other hand, if we believe that the book reveals the principles of divine and moral government which are constantly operating so that whatever age we may happen to live in, we can see God's hand in history and His mighty arm protecting us and giving us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, then and only then are we edified and comforted. So here's an important thing I think that you can remember. If you really want to understand the book of Revelation, if you want to understand the symbolism and the types of Revelation, then as I have been saying from the very beginning of this series, go to the Old Testament because this is where the, the, John largely draws his, his imagery from. Go to the, the Old Testament and not today's newspapers or the Internet. Skip all the speculations of man and go straight for the truth. All right. Let me, let me add one more here, and that is that the trumpets do not depict a different period in history after the seals, but rather a recapitulation. In other words, a, a, a retelling of the same events from a different perspective. So do not view the trumpets in, as I've been saying, a chronological way. Do not do this as, as if the events coming at they're, they're, the trumpets are events that are coming after the seals. As I've stated before, one of the dangers of viewing Revelation from a purely futurist view, meaning that uh, it's chronological, this comes first, then this, then this, and it all takes place uh, in the future, i.e. Our, our particular time period, then if you view it that way, it takes away any meaning the book has had for the last 19 centuries before us. And friends, I just want to ask you, do we really believe that? I mean, do we really believe that Jesus gave this book to John, these revelations to John, and to the first century Christians only to say to them, you know, hey, there's great stuff in here. It's really amazing, but none of this is really for you. It's for people that are going to live 2,000 years into the future. Do we really want to say that? Is that what we really believe? I know I don't. Now, that is not to say that this book has no meaning for us. It does. But it is to say, and this is key, it is to say that it has no more meaning or significance for us than it did for the people in John's day. All right, so that's a bit of a, an introduction to the trumpets. Let me give you now a little bit of, uh, let's look at the individual trumpets here. I want to uh, give an explanation for each of these. So the first four of these trumpets show God's judgment in the form of, of catastrophic events in nature uh, designed to bring God's judgment on his, on his enemies, particularly those who have opposed the gospel, have opposed Christ, and have persecuted his people. So, the first trumpet, let's look at that one. It's the trumpet with hail, fire, and blood. We see that in verse 7. It says, The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the angels were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Now, again, echoing back, what's he doing here? He's going to the Old Testament. John's pulling images, this time from the book of Exodus. And if we go to Exodus 9, here's what we read. It says, there was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail, very heavy hail, such as has never been seen in the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the field in all of the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And the hail struck down every plant of the field and broke every tree of the field. So <clears throat> in this first trumpet, the picture here is one of nature being out of control. You've got storms fires, devastation that man cannot prevent. Think of all of these that happen over the course of our history, just in our lifetime. But go back even further than that. You see these time and time again. Um, and that's what's pictured here. Uh, the blood here, I think, is probably intended to communicate the, the effect that it has on, on us as human beings. It brings pain and, and death. So that's the first trumpet. How about the second one? The second one is where the sea becomes blood. Look at verse 8. It says this, the second angel blew his trumpet and something like, something like a great mountain. He's not sure what it is. He says it's something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood and a third of the living creatures in the seas died and a third of the ships were destroyed. Again, here's an allusion to the plagues, uh, particularly the first plague where God turns the Nile River to blood and everything died and stank, the scripture says. And so the picture here is that this judgment in nature brings economic hardship and death to many. 
But what about the third trumpet? That's that one called wormwood. What an interesting word, wormwood. Look at verse 10. It says, The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is wormwood. A third of the waters became wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had become, or, or had been rather, made bitter. So uh, wormwood is actually a bitter herb that if you, you put it in water, it makes it nasty. It makes it undrinkable. Uh, one authority stated that uh, one ounce, just listen to this, one ounce of wormwood could be detected in 524 gallons of water. So that's, that's pretty potent. So what's meant by this, this trumpet? Well, I think a couple of possibilities. One is, is this, that water is basic to life on earth. I mean, if you don't have water, we all die. So you take it away, you pollute it, we're all in trouble. So perhaps this is referring to literal events that will shatter civilizations from time to time, affecting our, our limited uh, water supply. But another possibility here <clears throat> is that in the Old Testament, it associates wormwood with the bitterness of suffering that comes from God's judgment. So we see this fact uh, told to us in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 15, and also in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 15, and Jeremiah 23, verse 15. So in Jeremiah's day, here's kind of the background. The nation was corrupt, and Israel's leaders bore the greatest guilt by leading the nation astray. The scripture declares that both the prophet and the priest were ungodly, and that because of these things, God sent bitter suffering. He sent wormwood upon them all. And so wormwood here in Revelation, it may represent something similar, that because people have set their heart against God and against His people, that He will, sing, so he will bring suffering upon them, that they will find no lasting rest or, or, or real enjoyment in life. Life will be bitter. It will never be truly satisfying. Well, how about the fourth trumpet, the trumpet of darkness in verse 12? It says the in verse 12, the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. So <clears throat> you probably have had this happen in your life. If you, uh, you've ever been in a really well-lit environment and the lights just suddenly and unexpectedly go out, what do people do? They gasp. They react with panic. And I think that's because there's something just inherently within us. That's, there's something unsettling to us about darkness. In the Bible, uh, darkness describes hell. Uh, it, it describes the removal of God's blessings. Uh, you remember the plagues of, of darkness in Moses' day? Uh, the Bible says that the darkness was so thick in Egypt that the Scripture says you could actually feel it. I don't, I don't think we've ever been in a darkness quite that bad, uh, but that doesn't, that sounds pretty awful. So <clears throat> this fourth trumpet we see, um, it, we see the entire universe is involved here, the sun, the moon, the stars, they're all being used by the Lord to send a clear message to those who oppose Him and His people. So these judgments here, um, as we look at them collectively, uh, all four of them, we, we see that they're they're ecological, they're economic, they're industrial, they're certainly spiritual in nature. God is crushing the idolatry of humans who have put their confidence in their own strength, their own attainments and their riches, and all the while rejected Him. And so like the Pharaoh and the Egyptians of old, God is showing our world the, the futility of placing your security in these things and the consequences that come from persecuting His people. But God is not finished driving home His point to a fallen world. We need to look on to one more verse here in our text, verse 13. Then I looked and I heard an, an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. So an eagle is a bird of prey. What does he do? He circles his prey before coming in for the kill. And you'll notice that the eagle is crying here with a loud voice, three words in repetition, woe, woe, woe. So the repetition of this word three times is a literary device in the Hebrew language. Uh, it's meant to tell us something very important. In fact, do you, 
Do you know what's, there's only one other instance in all of Scripture where something is repeated three times like that. Do you remember what it is? I'm sure you do. It's holy, holy, holy. In Isaiah chapter 6, where we see that God is holy, holy, holy. We see it also here in the book of Revelation. So it tells us something very important about God's nature. And similarly, the repetition of this word, woe, 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 tells us something very significant we should pay attention to. Now, if you look at the meaning of this word, woe, Woe is a, is a really bad word. It's a word of misfortune and sadness. It's the opposite of being blessed. Uh, it, in essence, means how, it, it means how terrible for you, how dreadful, how unfortunate for you. Uh, Jesus used this word woe often in his earthly ministry. He used it in reference to spiritual leaders who rejected him, even certain towns who would have nothing to do with his, him or his ministry. Their rejection, Jesus said, in essence, would be costly. So the eagle's warning here of woe serves really as a fitting conclusion uh, that, that, uh, to this chapter. And it makes, this chapter really makes three things abundantly clear to us. So let me give you some trumpet takeaways. Um, really, uh, just a few things here. Number one, God is certain to judge sin in terrible ways. That's, that's a, just a truth that comes just right off the pages to us. Now, we may push back on that and we go, well, how can a good God judge the world so harshly? You know, many people, especially in our world today, are offended. They are deeply offended at the notion that God would judge them, that God would judge the world. Well, my question to you, if, if you struggle with that, is what kind of God would, would He be if He didn't judge evil? I mean, do we really want a God that gives evil a pass? Do we really want a God that never cause, causes the wrongs of this world to face the day of justice? Do we really want a God that basically says, hey, I'm only going to bless you, uh, but I'm never going to call to question the, the wrong things that you've done in life? If I could make an analogy, and, and it's not a perfect one, but just hear it out with me. You know, when, when we see a permissive parent who never disciplines their errant child, but only showers him with blessing and praise, we surmise that there is, in essence, a flaw in their, their parenting. Why is that? Because a child must know when he's doing something wrong. And if you only shower him or her with praise, um, you build their self-esteem really well, um, but you teach them nothing about how um, he or she wrongly treats the rest of the world around them. So it is precisely because God is good and holy, that he must deal with man's sin and evil. God punishes evil because he hates what sin does in our world. He hates how his people are treated. He hates how it makes idolaters of, out of us. And so when we, we see natural disasters and terrible calamities come upon the earth, it's a reminder of God's judgment on sin and our need of repentance and salvation. But here's a second truth for us to take away, and that is that these judgments express a measure of mercy. Sometimes we forget that, but I want you to notice here in our text that there are 13 times, 13 times in the chapter where we see, quote, a third, a third reference in terms of the destructiveness of these, these uh, judgments. So God, God could judge mankind more heavily. He could, and He could be completely just. He would be completely just if He did this. But instead, He exercises here a measure of mercy. These judgments are like the calm before the real storm. They are initial judgments by God against sin, not final doom. So a good way to, to, to think of this is to remember that trumpets announce, uh, they, 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 they send a warning, but bowls, as we're going to see, they pour out the full measure of God's wrath. So the trumpets here, they're a wake-up call. They're a warning call that gives us time to consider the gospel and the way that we are living and come to repentance while we still can. You know, contrary to what a lot of people in our culture think today, God does not, God does not delight in judgment. In fact, He, he prefers uh, mercy over judgment. Uh, in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11, this is what the Scripture says, As I live, declares the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his way and live. Not only that, let me give you another quick example of this. In Exodus chapter 20, here's what God says to His people. He says, I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my 
commandments. Did you, did you notice the contrast there? So God punishes sins up to the third or, or the fourth generation. But what does he do to those who love him? He shows mercy to a thousand generations. That doesn't mean if you get to a thousand and one generation, he cuts you off. No, it, it simply means that his love is far greater than you could ever imagine or appreciate. His, his mercy is far greater, in essence, than his judgment. But let me give you a third truth. Number three, these judgments express God's displeasure with the treatment of his people. So again, the, the plagues of Moses' day, they're the backdrop that we should see as we look at the trumpets. They're, they were, and, and when you think about the plagues of Moses' day, they were to show um, that the God of Israel was superior to the gods of Egypt. And they were to show that he came to, a, to judge the powers that oppressed his people. Uh, Egypt at that time was a powerful, wealthy, secure nation. I mean, uh, they, they, it, there was a period of time where it looked like they just had an endless supply of wealth. And so they built, they uh, built the pharaohs built great monuments and temples and pyramids and sphinxes and um, they, things that were among the, the ancient wonders of the world. But then think of this. Under the hand of God, an 80-year-old man comes walking out of the desert, and this powerful, self-sufficient, prosperous nation is literally brought to his knees. God's message? Well, it's this. Your wealth, your, your gods, the things that you put your security in, none of it is a true refuge uh, in this life. Now, you might be thinking, but wait a minute, okay, if, if, if Egypt was the backdrop for the trumpets, then it, that means we got to think about who, who did Egypt represent in John's day? Who would have been Pharaoh in Egypt in John's day? And the answer is, in the first century, it would have been Emperor Domitian, and it would have been Rome. And the message would have been the same. Leave my people alone. Leave them alone. Set them free. But the allusion to Egypt is not just limited to Rome's day, but it represents nations and leaders and people even today. It represents how the world system treats the people of God. Um, noting the, this connection, G.B. Card makes a, an interesting observation. He says, in each of the heavenly trumpet blasts, God is saying to the Pharaoh of the new Egypt, meaning the new Egypt of our time, let my people go. To us, the message is the same. One Jesus uh, said in Luke's gospel, now when these things when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. So when truly catastrophic things happen in nature, not only uh, should, should we just see them as just events, we should see them as judgments of God, yes, but also we should see them as reminders of God's coming salvation for His people. Well, I said I was going to give you three takeaways. Let me give you a fourth, and that is that these events challenge our personal faith. So um, one thing I think is clear in Revelation is that there's no really there's no such thing as a really as a um, what we would call a natural disaster. Uh, insurance companies used to call them acts of God, and I think they got that kind of right. Uh, the events are uh, that we see here that God is the, the is the hand behind all of these things, um, and these events are relevant for Christians and non for Christ, for for Christians and non Christians as well. So what do we do with disastrous events in life? Well, we, we certainly see here that, uh, that they're sent to punish the wicked, yes. But as a Christian, do, do we see them as sent by God to do something different for us? That is to, to refine our faith, to cause us to draw closer to Christ? Or do we become angry at God and become hardened towards Him? You know, our response when these kinds of things happen is very telling about the state of our hearts. So these trumpets, they affect the various parts of life on earth, the land, the sea, the water, the light. Um, there's nowhere we see in Revelation here that the wicked can hide from the judgment of God. And the question is, will the wicked man hide his, uh, harden his heart even farther to, against God, or will he humble himself um, and follow Christ? And really that's the question for people in John's day as well as it is for the people in our day. Will we harden our hearts to God or will we follow Him? Let's pray together. Lord, thank You, God, for a difficult passage like this one, a challenging one to understand, to, to preach, to, to, um, to apprehend as we think about the harsh judgment that You are bringing upon this earth. And, um, but help us to remember that in Your judgment there is mercy 
and that in, in your judgment, that really this is an answer to the prayers of your people crying out for justice, that you bring judgment upon this earth because you love your people, because just as the Israelites of old were mistreated and you defended them, so even today you are defending your people against the persecution and mistreatment that they experience, whether that's in the Middle East or whether that's in America or whether that's in Africa, wherever your people are mistreated, you are their defender. You plead their cause. You answer their prayers and you stand with them. And so, Lord, whatever comes in our lives, whatever difficulties, help us to, to, to remember that behind all of them there is a God at work and that you use these difficulties not to punish your people, but to refine them and shape them into the image of your son. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Temple friends, family, guests, thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed Pastor West's message. And um, I want to make you aware of a memorial service we're going to have coming up on May the 16th. We hope you'll join us uh, in the sanctuary for that memorial service. We'll remember those that we've lost over this past year. And, uh, you know, COVID kind of put us in a place where uh, funerals weren't what they used to be the way it was. And we just want to remember all those family and friends that we've lost over this past year. If you want to submit a family member, uh, you could send a picture of that individual with their name to Caleb at templechurch.net. If you have questions about this event, please contact us at the church office. Have a great week. Know that we miss you. We love you. God bless you.